Well, hello everybody and good afternoon and uh, uh, thanks a lot for joining us here for the final uh, presentation in the 2021 Covey Lecture Series. Um, my name is Dan Dakin and I'll, I'll be your moderator once again this afternoon. Uh, the lecture today will run for about 45 minutes and then we'll have a question and answer period at the end. Um, so please use the chat window here and uh, ask your questions. Um, and I'll, I'll read them out uh, uh, once Professor Kwong uh, finishes up his presentation. So um, I am very pleased uh, today to welcome uh, Associate Professor Lester Kwong, uh, who's going to give our presentation. Quick, uh, quick background, uh, Professor Kwong graduated uh, with his PhD in economics from the University of British Columbia um, in 2005. Um, and has been at Brock ever since, uh, currently serving as an associate professor and chair of the Department of Economics. Uh, he's an applied micro theorist who specializes in industrial organization. And in particular, he has an interest in the application of economic theory uh, in the wine industry and has pub published in a variety of journals, uh, such as the Canadian Journal of Economics, uh, Applied Economics, and in specialized journals, uh, such as the Journal of Wine Economics and the Journal of Wine Business Research. So today, Professor Kwong is going to uh, share his latest research in a lecture titled, Judging Wines, Preferences, Evaluation, and Aggregation. So with that, I'll say uh, welcome, Professor Kwong, and I'll turn the, uh, turn the screen over to you. Thank you, Dan. Uh, so uh, thank you for uh, attending the lecture. Uh, as the name suggests, it's a topic on judging wines, preferences, evaluation, and aggregation. So just a quick background in terms of what this uh, paper's uh, about the, the uh, this presentation is about a year late since it was canceled last year due to COVID. Uh, and it's largely based on a paper that me and my co-author, a colleague of mine at the economics department, uh, Ling Soon, published in the Journal of Wine Business Research. So this is what uh, the paper is largely based on, although there's gonna be some aspects of other papers that, uh, or other research that we've been working on that, has, uh, that we're gonna be drawing information from. So uh, with that said, start with an introduction here. Uh, as we all know, probably, that shelf talkers in wine shops, when we go into, a, let's say, for example, the LCBO and whatnot, they're a very important marketing tool. Uh, wine sh or shelf talkers such as expert ratings, oftentimes you'll see a rating that's hanging on a bottle of wine or perhaps a sticker on a wine that tells you what a certain taste or an expert rating for a wine is, hoping that, you know, for example, if the wine rating is sufficiently high, that it would, it would encourage people to buy it uh, and, and increase sales and whatnot as a result of it. Uh, these expert ratings uh, also include things such as results from wine competitions. So, you know, such as the picture that I have written here from the International Wine uh, Challenge, if you get a gold medal or a silver medal or whatnot, uh, those stickers often appear on bottles to encourage people or to attract individuals, consumers to make these purchases as a result. So consumers often rely on these heavily as a source of information when they, when they enter into the, to the wine shop to uh, perhaps uh, buy a bottle of wine and whatnot. So what, what our objective here is to try and figure out, you know, how important these types of information uh, is for the consumers. Now, when we talk about these uh, shelf talkers, as we did before, in terms of expert ratings, when you see an expert rating, say, say for example, a Robert Parker rating of an 85 versus a 90, this rating or this difference in rating is a very obvious uh, signal. It's ordinal in the sense that the number 90 is in fact a bigger number than 85. And so from a qualitative perspective, from a consumer's eyes, it's clear that the 90 is going to be a superior bottle to the bottle of uh, a wine that's rated in 85. You contrast this to the idea of wine competitions. Does the same thing actually hold in the case of wine competitions? Are results from wine competitions comparable to that of the expert rating? Now, again, the difference here being that wine competitions usually involve a panel of judges that determine uh, a sort of a final score for these types of wine. And so our, our question really largely based on the idea of whether or not this information from a group of individuals can in fact be summarized clearly into a single score. Okay, so as an, uh, as an example, does an 85 versus a 90 deliver the exact same implications? And if not, or if so, or perhaps even so, 
uh, there's a gold medal versus a silver medal uh, make any distinction in that sense. Now, just to be clear in terms of what these medals are actually, or how these medals are usually uh, awarded is oftentimes what happens is you have a panel of judges in these competition and each individual uh, judge assigns a particular score to a wine after tasting it. And then somehow these scores across the panel of judges is aggregated together. And we're going to talk more about this aggregation process, right? And the aggregation that we're usually thinking about is an average, for example. So if you take the average score across individual judges for a given wine, then of course the wines can then be ranked based on the score that they receive. And oftentimes then these medals are awarded based on the threshold that these wines are, are, are going to be in given their final score. So for example, if a 90 and above represents for you a gold medal and then 80 to a 90 a score would give you a silver medal and so on, once you pass that threshold of a 90, then you would be awarded a gold medal as a result. And so the question really becomes then, is a wine that's rated with a 91, which passes into the gold medal threshold versus a wine that's rated, let's say, for example, 88, which sits in the silver medal threshold, are those distinctions really that clear? And what exactly does it imply? Okay. That's, and that's the objective of really uh, largely what we're going to be trying to answer uh, in this paper. And second of all, there's... Uh, you know, there's a large stream of literature that, that has currently come out uh, in recent years dealing with the evaluation of individual judges in these wine tasting panels as well. So, for example, if you have a panel of judges, let's say, for example, you have five of these individuals and they're all tasting these wines, the question becomes, are they actually that reliable? How consistent are these judges relative to their peers? Uh, do they, how well do they perform? Now, of course, this is a really tricky question to answer from any perspective, simply because there's no real way to evaluate the performance of a particular judge unless for some reason, the underlying quality of the wine is known. So for example, if you think about a particular wine, and let's just say for whatever reason, that wine has a quality uh, uh, rating or whatever it is of 85. Now the question is not where does this 85 come from, but let's just say objectively there is this, this rating, there's this quality level of 85. And of course, if you allow individuals to start tasting this wine and they, they assign scores to this, let's say, for example, someone tastes the, this particular wine and they think it's rated 88, then there's a deviation of three points from what the true score happens to be. Okay. Now, of course, this is a very abstract problem that we're thinking about because, of course, the 85 that we've assigned or have attributed to this particular wine doesn't actually exist, right? This is a fictitious uh, uh, number that we're assigning to it. So in that sense, then, the question becomes, how can we actually evaluate the performance of judges in these sort of um, wine tasting panels in the absence of actually knowing what the true qualitative features of the wines are? Okay. And the most common, common way around it that individuals have done in research, or individuals have examined in, in research, is by simply looking at the average score. You know, what we mean by that is to say, within the panel, if you have five judges that are, that are tasting this wine, they assign five different scores. If you take the average of those scores, it is then assumed that this average represents, in, for some reason, the true quality of the wine. And the question becomes, how far do you deviate from that particular average that's assigned in terms of your consistency and measurements of, uh, across different wines? And that's the typical way or the standard way that individuals have examined uh, in terms of how well a, a judge is performing is by saying how well he stays uh, relative to the average, which in some ways it's very desire. It's a very simple uh, calculation for us to compute. Uh, it's a very simple way to obtain this, this comparison, but it's not necessarily the most correct way of doing so. Okay, so those are some aspects of this problem that we're gonna be examining within this paper as well, or within this, this presentation. Now the average is of course used in many instances. So for example, uh, in a very you know, popular online sort of seller management software um, developed by Eric Levine called Seller Tracker, right? Seller Tracker is this free online software or sort of shareware type of online software for, for tracking your seller or your wine seller in terms of your inventory. And oftentimes what happens is then individuals are able to taste the wine that they own and if they want, they can, they can keep a database of their, for example, tasting notes and scores and whatnot. Uh, 
Now, since these, this is drawing from a common database in terms of uh, the inventory of individuals' wines, uh, it's, it has an ability to then aggregate up all the information right across the world of everyone who's using the software. So for example, if you're drinking a, a particular bottle that someone else has, or has drunk as well, the score that you would report, as well as other individuals who have also reported a score, would all be shown on the website. And in return as well, aside from the individual uh, individuals uh, entries into the into the seller tracker, the average of those scores is also reported. Okay? Now again, the average is a, is a is a summary statistic that's often and then interpreted as as, as I noted earlier, the, the some somewhat true quality of what the wine is. Other instances that are that use the average in calculating a wine is, for example, decanter. So the the publication decanter magazine. They often taste wines with panels as well, and then the average of the of the scores of across different uh, tasters within the panel are then reported as a summary statistic, um, indicating what the, that wine happens to be. And in fact, in Decanter magazine noted that tasting panels, okay, and this quote comes from that magazine, uh, tasting panels are selected to create a balance between specialists, expert tasters, uh, MWs, and wine journalists. Their scores are then averaged out to create this objective verdict. Okay. So in relation to this, this, you know, to these types of questions, the, you know, I'm just gonna talk about quickly what the related literature uh, that exists out there are. Ashenfelter and Quant, for example, talked about the statistical frequency of, of wine ratings, of how judges perform. Uh, Cardabe, uh, Peroisian, and myself, uh, Ling Soon and Don Sear, also have looked at this uh, idea of, of um, looking at the statistical distribution of scores by a given taster uh, and trying to evaluate how we can make comparisons between different tasters by using, by learning from how they actually do these scorings. Uh, other parts of the literature have studied individual judge performance, as I noted before, Hodgson in a sequence of papers uh, talks about you know evaluating how individual judges perform relative to some average. Cliff and King as well, and Cow and Stokes uh, uh, in particular, uh, they they studied this sort of novel Bayesian learning technique using statistical methods to examine again exactly this idea of how much does an individual uh, judge deviates in terms of their uh, evaluation of a particular wine relative to the true nature or the true quality of the wine, often then interpreted as the average. Okay. So the average here seems to be you know, somewhat consistently used within the literature in trying to proxy for the true quality of the wine. Okay. Aside from this, the second uh, set of papers that we talked about, which doesn't really look at the, the, the average, uh, it looks at the median and the actual distribution of in of the, across all the scores that are given by a particular judge, as opposed to just simply looking at the average, right? Uh, so that said, this uh, this paper is uh, unfortunately it's a it's a, it's an it's an applied theoretical paper. So if you actually read the paper itself, it's it's rather technical, and I'm trying to avoid as much of the technical aspects of it as possible, so I can deliver it. Uh, in a meaningful way into the, in this lecture. So I'm going to try and avoid it as best as possible. But that said, some of it will have to kind of carry through. So I'm gonna try my best to explain to you exactly what's happening in terms of what we're looking at, what each of these things mean. And then hopefully I can derive some examples where I can demonstrate to you uh, what the implications are through a, a sequence of, uh, of examples later on. So I'm gonna start with a uh, the, the primitives of the problem. Okay. So this is the, the idea of the, of the model. Uh, we're gonna assume that, for example, let's imagine that we're in a competition and that there are two different wines to be evaluated, wine X and wine Y, okay, whatever they happen to be. And this is to be evaluated by a number of judges. We can call that number N, okay? You can say, for example, there's five different judges. Whatever this number N happens to be, the only requirement that we need is that it's a finite number, which seems to be uh, a reasonable assumption to make. Okay, so we have a finite number of judges that are going to evaluate two different wines, wine X and wine Y. We're gonna use this notation here to denote the preference structure of these individual wines, or, or the, sorry, the, the preference structure of the individual judges. Now, of course, when you drink a bottle of wine or when you taste a wine, let's say wine X, for example, there are certain characteristics or attributes associated with this wine. For example, the types of grapes that are used, right? The, the amount of time it's spent in oak, uh, 
you know, all, all these different variations or uh, attributes that we can assign to it, that can be in principle summarized by this individual taster. He's able to taste this wine and extract this information or some sort of meaningful way of, of evaluating the qualitative features of this wine. And this, this, this way of evaluation or the preference structure as we call it here is summarized by exactly what this is, okay? It's summarized by this, this notation. And so we use this notation to write then if X is related to Y in this particular way, then what we really mean is that this individual judge is going to strictly prefer X to Y, okay? And if we have this little tilde on the bottom, this is almost like an equality in the greater than or equal to sign, then what this implication is is that the, the wine X is weakly preferred to Y. Now, the difference between strictly preferred versus weakly preferred is a very standard one within economics, but literally what it would mean is that if it's weakly preferred, you could be indifferent between the two. Okay? So they could be seen as, as uh, not only does it need to be necessarily better than Y, okay? so X doesn't need to be necessarily better than Y, but in fact, X could also be indifferent to Y from that judge's perspective. The index that we have here, I, represents for us the ith judge, okay? So if this would happen to be a number one, then we're talking about judge number one here. So that's the idea. This is just the notation to get us through some of this, uh, some of this material that we're gonna be presenting. Next, this, this preference structure then is representable by this evaluation function, okay? So in a way, when we say, well, this individual is able to evaluate and say this wine is better than that one, that's not enough from our perspective. What is What we also need is the individual uh, will judge to be able to say, you know what, I can actually evaluate that particular wine using a numerical score. And so this set of real numbers that this, this, this relation is mapping to, so we're looking for this relationship where the individual judge can take these two bottles and then somehow evaluate it into a, by assigning a numerical score to it. Now here we're just mapping it to the real line, which you know includes the whole uh, from minus infinity to positive infinity, but by no means do we need to use the whole thing, okay? So typically what you can think about here is that it's just an assignment of score, okay? So you drink a bottle of wine, let's say wine X, I'm able to evaluate it and then assign this some sort of a score of 90 or whatever it is to somehow meaningfully represent my preferences underlying this, this wine. And the, and the important thing is that this evaluation process or this a way of assigning this, this, uh, this numerical score is actually representing the individual judge's preference structure as we talked about up here. And so the implications behind this is that whatever score you assign to wine X and whatever score you assign to wine Y that the score for wine X can only be strictly larger than the score for wine Y, if and only if you strictly prefer wine X to wine Y, okay? And this is a very common way of establishing this relationship between preferences versus a numerical representation of it. So here, what we're really saying is, you know, if I'm a particular judge and I'm tasting two different wines and I assign a wine of score of 90 and I assign a score of, uh, of, to another wine of 88, excuse me, that the fact of the matter is the nine, the 90 is a strictly larger number than the number 88. And so therefore, what necessarily needs to happen is that this judge is going to say, I strictly prefer wine X to wine Y as a result of that. We don't want an instance where the wine, the judge actually strictly prefers wine Y to wine X while having a, a lower score for wine Y. Okay. So the score here is supposed to be a true representation of the individual's preferences or the judge's preferences in this instance. And so in that sense, what we mean is that that ranking should actually be represented through that, those numbers that are being assigned by the individual judge. Okay. So that's the basic structure behind the judge in terms of what's going on. It's really not, not much to it uh, once we dig deep enough or once we look, look beyond you know, the notation and whatnot here, all we're really saying is that the individual judge has a preference structure over these wines, and he's just going to assign these numerical values to it, but these numerical values actually mean something, right? It actually represents that ranking he has in preferences. Now, what we're going to get to now is the, the, the idea that within an evaluation process then, now, sorry, before I even get there, 
if the, if the story stops here, so if you have an individual wine expert, so this would be, say, for example, a Robert Parker that you see in the, the LCBO, you see a shelf talker hanging there saying a Robert Parker score of 90 or whatever it is, right? That 90 is going to be a lot more meaningful because this is just Robert Parker, right? And not, not because of the name, but because a 90 from Robert Parker is can be compared to an 88 from Robert Parker. The difficulty or the, the, the problem that arises is some publications such as, for example, Decanter, which aggregates individuals, right? So they have to have a tasting panel, such as a wine competition, decanter, seller tracker, or whatever it is that we're thinking about. If you have a number of individuals that are actually tasting, and somehow the scores of these individuals are aggregated up into a single numerical representation, or the interpret or the, the translation of this single number into a, a sort of a scoring category, like a gold medal, silver medal, and so on. What does this aggregation process actually look like? Okay, and this is the, the, the problem that we're gonna be examining here in terms of what the aggregation that we're gonna be looking at. So when we talk about aggregation in this paper, what we're really saying is how are we gonna take those numbers from the number of different judges we have and somehow summarize it into a way. Okay, and so by this, this is what we mean, this wine score aggregation is simply going to take then from our perspective, the scores that are received from the end different judges, that's what this notation is gonna mean, Okay, so it's gonna take as, as an input the scores of the N individual judges, and it's gonna spit out in return then a single numerical value, okay? So for example, if we're looking at the average, that's one way of doing that. Okay, and and the, the formal way that we're gonna write this out or the way that we can represent it is that as you can see, if you have a profile of evaluations, so E1 here would represent for me the score that's assigned by evaluator one or judge number one. This is the score that's evaluated, that's, that's assigned by evaluator two and so on and all the way to the nth individual. When I make, when I input all of these in here, when I put in all of those scores, it's going to then spit out for me some numerical value. And this numerical value is gonna be a summary of, of what the judges have assigned it. Okay, so just as, as an example, as I noted before, if you have five different judges that evaluate a wine and then they assign these, these, these hypothetical scores to it, imagine that judge number one assigned it a value of 80, judge number two and 83, or sorry, judge number two and 83, judge three and 81 and so on. Then if we're just simply looking at the average, then we just, you know, take those numbers and we input it into the fun function or to this to this relationship, and it's gonna spit out for you this number 83. So the 83 here is the average across all the five judges, and this 83 is therefore going to somehow represent for us, or somehow it's gonna represent for whoever this is using the score as a representation of the evaluation, okay, or the qualitative uh, features of this, uh, uh, of this particular um, wine that's being tasted. Okay. And as another example, imagine that you have two different wines. Let's say, for example, wine X and wine Y, and you have the following uh, scores from four different judges. Okay, so we're saying that there's four judges that are tasting both of these wines. And as you can see here, <coughs> judge number one assigned, so this X here represents for me the, uh, the wine that's being tasted. This Y represents for me the other wine. So the first in, uh, in, input here, 80, is going to give me the score that's been assigned by judge number one. Judge number one, on the other hand, assigned a score of 82 to wine Y, okay? Likewise, judge number two assigned a score of 82 for wine X, and judge number two assigned a score of 80 for wine Y, okay? And so that's the way that we wanna read these two equations here, or these two representations. The, the E of X, this object here, gives me the, the profile of evaluations of the four judges in order for Y and X, and E of Y gives me the profile of evaluation for the judges in order again uh, for Y and Y. And the important thing that I wanted to note in this particular example is that if we just simply look at the average, right? So we're gonna take those numbers, add them all up and divide it by four. That's gonna give me the simple numerical average of this. So the, the average of these wines would yield for me then this aggregated solution or this aggregated number. So through the aggregation f of x, if you remember from the previous slide, we said that f itself is the aggregation. So if we're using this aggregation of just simply looking at the average, then when I input this profile into the aggregator, it's going to spit out for me the score of 84 and a half. 
Likewise, if I input this 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 profile of uh, evaluations for Y and Y into the same aggregator, it's going to spit out for me a score of 81.5. Now, this is not very difficult or, or surprising to find, but what this really means from our perspective when we look at this is that in principle, the results suggest to us that Y and X is preferred to Y and Y by the panel of judges. Okay, why is that? Well, simply because the 84 and a half is a much larger number than this 81 and a half. However, and here's one of the issues that, that arises then, on the other hand, if the aggregation somehow is a little bit different, okay? So the difference that we're going to make it is, let's say, for example, instead of just taking all of the numbers and looking at the average, what we're going to do is we're going to remove what we sometimes often do is remove what we call the outliers, right? So let's remove the most extreme scores that are received. Let's remove the highest score and the lowest score. And with the remaining scores, let's look at the average between those. Okay. And we'll use those instead. So instead we're going to remove the highest and the lowest scores. And if we did that, then the new aggregation, as you can see here, what we're really doing here is we're going to take this profile of scores received for Y and X across the four judges. And what we're going to really do is we're going to throw away this 95 because it's the highest score in there. And we're going to throw away this 80 because it's the lowest score in there. And so what we, what we have remaining is this score of 82 and 81. And what we're going to do is we're going to use those two to compute now the new average, right? Of course, 82 and 81, the average between those two, is going to give me then the score of 81.5. Likewise, I'm going to look over here, and I'm going to remove the highest score, which would be one of these 82s, and I'm going to remove this lowest score, which is 80, and the remaining two scores is going to give me an average as well. The average of 82 and 82 is clearly going to be 80. Too. And as you can see, because we're using a different way of aggregating these results, even though the results themselves haven't changed from the individual judges, the outcome here is obviously going to be different. As you can see, the resulting evaluation that we get from the aggregator that we've used spits out for me a score of 81.5 for Y and X, whereas the score is an 82 for Y and Y. And since 82 is obviously larger than 81.5, the resulting interpretation of this aggregated score is now completely different than what we had in, in before. In the past, when we just simply use the normal average, we, we, the, we infer from that score that Y and X was preferred to Y and Y by the panel of judges. On the other hand, now Y and Y is now the preferred Y and over Y and X by the panel of judges if we use this new way of aggregation. So of course, as you can see, the way that we aggregate these these uh, profile of evaluations that we receive from the from the judges, the panel of judges, is going to be very sensitive to what we actually get as a result. Now that's only half of the story that we have, right? The way the half of the story that we have is just simply how do we aggregate it? That's one question that we have. The second part of the problem is is more, you know, drawing in from, from a study or from a branch of economics uh, called social choice. So here what we're going to ask instead is, what about group preferences? Okay. How do we actually define the preferences across the panel of judges that we observe? So if we use the same example as we did above, you know, the two different lines that we looked at, we can ask ourselves, hey, can we ask how does judge one actually prefer these wines? And we can see here, because the score 80 is below 82, okay, so we're gonna, so our objective here is to construct this, this preference indicator, okay, and this is gonna help us assign these numbers. So what essentially it does, I kind of skipped this bit in the, in the uh, presentation because it gets a little bit technical, but eventually, or essentially, what we're trying to do here is have this gamma function that assigns three different values, minus one, zero, and one. In the event that it's minus one, what this means is that this object here, this first entry, this would be y and x, in relation to y and y, y and y is better than y and x from evaluator one's perspective. And this is obviously true because the score that has been assigned is 82 versus the score of 80 over here. So that's why we get a minus one here. Likewise, we get a minus one for judge three because judge three, as you can see, the score for y and y is 82 versus the score of 81. Okay, so if it's positive one, then of course the score for X is gonna be larger than the score of Y. And largely we allow for it to be equal to zero, that's when it happens to be tied. Okay, so the, the judges, it finds them to be uh, of equivalent quality or, or of equivalent preferences or indifference is what we call it. So here we have the profile of judges. 
okay, the preferences across the judges. And as you can see, just taking this collection of numbers or these values that we have, this is going to give me then the profile of evaluation or profile of preferences across the, uh, the, the individual uh, evaluators here, the judges. And what we want to do is we want to construct this function G or this relationship G, which takes such a profile and, re and in return spit out for us another set of values. This set of values is this, again, this minus one, zero, and one. Now, what exactly does this mean or the interpretation of this means? The thing that we're really after is to ask ourselves, when I input this preference structure, this minus one, one, minus one, one, Okay, this again represents for me the preferences of the individual judges, not just the numerical values. The numerical values is, is an assignment of quality features, but here we're asking even a more primitive question, which one is larger? Okay, this is obviously going to denote for us then the preference structure. If I input this preference structure into this function G, what I want this function G to spit out for me is an answer that tells me which the group or which wine the panel of judges will prefer, okay? So in this instance, if it spit out this number one, this would tell me that wine X is preferred to wine Y by this panel of judges, okay? Does that make sense? I hope, I hope, there's a, I hope that's clear for you. So G, again, what you wanna interpret G is, is it's, an, it's just a, some fictitious function that we want to evaluate or we wanna examine that potentially if it spits out this number one, it's gonna tell me that X is better than Y from the panel's perspective. If it spits out a number zero, it means that the two wines are indifferent from the panel's perspective. And if it spits out for me a minus one, it means that those two wines are, uh, or sorry, Y wine, wine Y is strictly preferred to wine X from the panel's perspective. Now, of course, I've left it very loose in terms of what that means. And the reason is very obvious or it should be very clear. The group preference functional is a fictitious object, right? It's a fictitious object. But what we want to know is whether or not we can actually have such a thing that would uniformly represent the aggregation that we're given, okay? Now, what do I mean by all of this? What I mean is the following. It's, a, it's, it's kind of a, a very convoluted thing, perhaps. This picture is going to, I don't know if it's gonna make it a little bit better or not, but, uh, but hopefully you can see from this picture whether or not it, this makes sense, okay? So here we have two wines, X and Y, and the wines are going to be going through the individual judges over here, okay? So this is the input. On the one hand, when the wine when the wine is evaluated by the uh, by the judges, he's going to assign it a score, okay? Each individual is going to assign it a score. So judge one is gonna assign X a score, judge one is gonna assign Y a score, judge two is gonna assign X a score, and judge two is gonna assign Y a score, and so on, right? We go through all of those different judges and they assign these scores. And now, of course, each of these judges in the process of doing this also has revealed what the preferences are. So in other words, we can then examine what each of these gammas are as well. So if, as, an, as, as a demonstration then, if judge one actually strictly prefers Y next to Y and Y, then if this is going to be a score of positive one. If judge two strictly prefers Y to X, then this is gonna give you a score of minus one and so on and so forth. And so the, 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 the consistency between these two is exactly that. Whichever score is higher is going to give me the right way of ranking it, okay? So that judge one or judge two or any judge for that matter will only assign a higher score for the wine that they strictly prefer to more, okay? And that's all this is saying over here. But the problem, the, 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 the fundamental difference here is one, a numerical value is assigned and two, this is simply a preference structure. This is simply giving me feedback in terms of saying, judge one strictly prefers this to this. Whereas this, judge one has somehow summarized that preference by saying, I'm gonna assign it a score of 80, and I'm gonna assign it a score of 75. And in contrast to that, then 80 is a bigger number than 75. And so therefore I strictly prefer the wine that scored an 80 over the wine that scored a 75. Now you might think of these two things as being identical and in a way they are because of this way that is represented, right? That this condition must be true, that in fact you can only assign a higher score if you strictly prefer to it. The problem here is, here when we talk about structure or preferences, it's one or the other. I strictly prefer this to this. But when we talk about scores, 
there's a whole range of values that we can assign it now, right? The idea that the number 90 is bigger than the number 85 means you strictly prefer a wine that's 90 over a wine that's 85. But at the same time, a wine that's rated 86 and 85 also receives that same preference structure, right, in comparison between the two. And so the question is, when I take all of these scores, which is supposedly an objective measure of quality, and I aggregate it up through that aggregator, whether it's an average or whatever, versus when I just ask the, the, the judges, which one do you actually prefer? And I take the profile of the preferences, and I try and come up with a way to say, hey, you know what, according to the group, this one is actually better without actually assigning any score to it. Okay. Now the question is, can we have a way to make these two things consistent? That's the biggest question that we're dealing with here. Is there a way for me to make these two things consistent? And what do I mean by make it consistent? I mean, literally then, is it possible for us to have a way that we can aggregate up those individual scores so that whenever this is bigger than this one, so whenever the aggregated score for wine X is bigger than the aggregated score for y and y, that it actually means, or it's actually consistent with the cases where the panel actually prefers y and x to y and y, okay? Now the obvious, or there might be seemingly an obvious answer to this, that uh, yeah, it should happen, but unfortunately this is often not going to be the case. And this is why we, we're, we have this, uh, we're, we're examining this particular paper. So the previous slide here that I kind of skipped over, basically alludes to what we just talked about there. Is it possible for us to have this relationship or construct this relationship between these two things so that this is going to be true, okay? And if that happens to be true, we're gonna call that representation uniformly represented, okay? So here as a summary then, for a given group preference functional, okay? So for a given way that we're gonna aggregate up these preferences that we have written down here, which aggregation, F, which, how do you actually summarize those individual scores that would actually represent that way, okay? Now, just as a, as a quick, um, um, just as a quick way of thinking about G, okay? a simple way of thinking about G, you can think about G as, for example, a majority, okay, a majority vote. So you're just basically asking the, the individual judges to raise their hands, do you prefer X to Y? And if the number of people that raise their hand is more than half, then you say, okay, then the group actually likes Y and X more than Y and Y, or strictly prefers Y and X over Y and Y, okay? So that's one way that we can think about what this group preference functional G is. So group preference functional G is, again, some way that we're gonna use up that information to give us this idea of what the group actually prefers. But the question is, if we have such a G, is there a way that we can aggregate the scores that would actually represent it and vice versa? Additionally then, for a given aggregation, which group preference functional will it in fact represent? Okay. So to help guide this analysis, uh, we're gonna have to examine this group functional uh, G a little bit more closely. Okay. And it, it seems like I'm already kind of alluded to Dan earlier before this presentation that it's, I don't think it's going to be 45 minutes long, but then again, it's uh, also anticipated to be running over time uh, due to the online nature. And it seems to be I'm running a little low on time, but I'll try and push this through as quickly as possible. So when I look at this symmetry, or sorry, when I look at this group function, a uh, group preference functional, this G, what we talked about as the majority uh, earlier, uh, one way we can interpret is the majority. There are certain properties that we wish for it to satisfy. So one is, for example, what we call symmetry, right? Symmetry just basically says the, the identity of the judges shouldn't matter, right? So if, for example, I, uh, judge number one strictly prefers X to Y, judge number two strictly prefers, you know, Y to X or whatever it is, if we just simply swap the identity of these judges, Okay, so if we call judge one, judge two instead, and if we call judge two, judge one, for example, if we permutate these, these rankings, it should have no effect on what the group preference functional is going to be. Okay, so that's the idea of uh, symmetry. <coughs> neutrality. Neutrality simply says, you know what, if you take the group preference functional, okay, so let's say, for example, let's take an extreme case, everyone likes y and x over y and y. And as an example of, and as a result of that, the group preference functional should in fact spit out for us then something like the group prefers Y next to Y and Y. 
Now, if we all of a sudden reverse that so that everyone prefers wine Y over wine X, then the group functional should also reverse that outcome. Okay, so neutrality just basically means the inverse of it should also follow to be the negative of what we get. Lastly, we have this positive responsiveness. And I thought that it would be best to explain what positive responsiveness is by simply using an example. Um, but effectively, what it would mean is that if there's, it's a tie-breaking thing. It's, it's almost like a, a tie-breaker in the sense that, you know what, if one is on the cusp of being indifference, then if you increase the score or the evaluation of one individual, so if one of these individuals all of a sudden says, you know what, I strictly prefer X to Y, then it should change that preference of the group, okay? If it's just on the marginal, if it's on the cusp. So if it's, uh, if it's, it's essentially what we're saying is really just a tiebreaker, okay? It's gonna be a tiebreaking rule. And with all of these three things said, oops, it's kind of, I shouldn't be scrolling. Okay, so with all of this being said, this gives us the first proposition. This is not my proposition. This is, this is a very important result coming out of social choice theory. And this is called May's theorem. The preference functional G is in fact the majority rule. Okay, so the simple majority rule that we talked about earlier, if and only if it is symmetric, neutral, and positive responsive. Okay, so the fact of the matter is, if it satisfies all three of these properties, and these properties are seemingly rather desirable and they're very uh, standardized in, in terms of uh, what we would like to see this group preference structure uh, exhibit, what May's theorem tells us is that the only one that would actually satisfy these is in fact the majority rule. And in fact, if you do not have the majority rule, not all three of these would be satisfied. And that's the biconditional condition that we have here. It's an if and only if statement. So not only is it necessary, it is also going to be sufficient as well. So this is May's theorem, which is drawn from uh, the, the literature and social choice. But with that then, this is the main result of our findings. And this says then, uh, it's, it's, if we forget about the technicality of this, what this really means okay, is that, in fact, if you want to represent a majority rule because we, oops, because we desire these properties, we desire symmetry, we desire neutrality, and we desire positive responsiveness, and because we desire these three properties that we have, we know we need a majority rule. And if we want to represent this majority rule, then what our results say is that it's impossible with a linear aggregator. In other words, you cannot simply just look at an average or a weighted average or any other way of adding these up in a linear way that can possibly represent that type of preference structure, okay? So in other words, this is a negativity result, negativity because it is an impossibility problem now, right? It's not possible for us to actually do this using these types of linear aggregators. So, uh, you know, I'm almost, finish my talk, even though there's a few more slides remaining, I'm just gonna run you through a couple of these examples just to uh, demonstrate exactly what we mean by this, this, these issues that are arising. So the first is this non-preservation of group or no rankings, what we call it. This is actually pulled from a decanter magazine on the 2007 Brunello tasting. Um, this is published, these actually show you exactly what this is. You have three evaluators for two different wines, and these are the scores that were received out of a score of 20. This is pre nine or pre 2012 page, or this, this, I grabbed it from a, um, from a date before 2012. And so they were still under the 20 point score then instead of the hundred point score, which they moved in into afterwards. But uh, this is when, when I looked at this, uh, when I grabbed this sample a long time ago, this is what the evaluations were. You have three judges that were reported and these were the, these were the scores that were received between the two wines. And what you'll see here, what you observe here is that clearly for judge number one, 16 is bigger than 11. And so therefore judge number one strictly prefers Y next to Y, Y. 18 is bigger than 16, 18 is bigger than 17. And so therefore wine Y is strictly preferred to wine X for both judge, judge two and judge three. Now, if we look at this average, okay, as the aggregator, what it would mean then is the average score received for wine X is the score of 16.33. And for wine Y is a score of 15.67. So therefore, as you can see, the average score for wine X is in fact bigger than the average score of wine Y. However, the preference structure that is given as revealed by the individual judges here, two judges actually prefer 
Y and Y over Y and X. So here you can see that there's a huge discrepancy here because even though the average is greater for Y and X, the, the panel in principle using a majority rule has indicated that Y and Y is actually better than Y and X. Okay? And of course you can see the reason for that is because of this large discrepancy in scores between X and Y. This huge drop of a score of five for judge one is really what's throwing everything off. Sorry. The second example that I want to run through is this idea of neutral response, okay? So the group preference profile, if we just go through the exact same thing, and here we're just going to evaluate looking at this judge, this judge one, looking at y and x and y and y and so on and so forth, we're going to assign these values of 0, 1, 0, uh, and whatnot <coughs> uh, for, uh, for these individual judges. So what you can see here is that the group preference profile for y and x can be represented by this profile here, 0, 1, 0, 0. And for y and y, it's this profile of 1, 0, 1, 1. So by symmetry, what this really means is that because we can reorder things as we wish, we're just going to reorder these two numbers so that we actually get this in return. Oops, sorry. And as you can see, what positive responsiveness implies is that the representation by the aggregator should in fact yield f of y is better than f of x. Okay. So positive response should tell us that the, the two should be exactly this, or sorry, that a y and y should be actually preferred to y and x. However, this is not going to be the case. As you can see, f of x is actually equal to f of y. And my apologies for running a little over time, but I'm, I promise I'm almost done. I'm only two slides away. And lastly, we have this intransitivity of weak group uh, preferences. Now here, intransitivity implies the following condition is happening. Under the majority rule, if we just simply ask ourselves, okay, when I compare between X and Y, which one does each prefer? And as you can see here, for y, for uh, judge number three, they're identical, right? So he has no preference between Y and X versus Y and Y. For judge number two, he prefers Y and Y over Y and X, and judge number one prefers Y and X over one, Y and Y. So if we're looking at a simple majority rule there, judges one and two, they just cancel each other out because they have opposing preferences, but judge number three is gonna be the, the tiebreaker. For him, he's already tied between the two. And so therefore, from the group's perspective, using a simple majority rule, Y and X is actually indifferent to Y and Y. Conversely, if we compare between Z and X, or Z and Y, there's two different Ys now. You can see 16 is better than five, 15, 16 is bigger than 15 and a half, and 17 and a half is bigger than 17. So you can see here, the group, obviously, two out of the three judges prefer Y and Z over Y and Y. And as a result of this, Y and Z is strictly preferred to Y and Y, according to, again, this simple majority rule. Now, if preferences were to be transitive, what this would suggest to us is that the Y and Z, because it's better than Y and Y, and Y and Y is, better, or is indifferent to Y and X, then Y and Z should be, in fact, better than Y and X. Sorry. However, this is not going to be the case. If you just simply compare X and Z now instead, and you look at these two individual rankings, you can see 15 and a half, 15 and a half. That's a tie for judge number two. Judge number one, 17 is bigger than 16. And judge number three, 17 and a half is bigger than 17. As you can see, again, judge one and three, they cancel each other out and leaving the group preference to be this indifference. Now, in principle, this is not going to be a surprising finding, this particular one, because this is just an, uh, a demonstration of Arrow's impossibility theorem, which is a well-known theorem in, uh, in social choice. All right, so in conclusion, okay, I'm just trying to wrap this up as quickly as possible. In conclusion, the use of linear aggregation will not represent truly uh, the group preference functionals. Okay? You cannot possibly use these linear aggregators to represent for us if we want to look at these majority uh rankings of wines uh, in these particular judge panels. So the use of the average score, which is of course an example of a linear aggregator, it's just one of many of course that we can use to decipher the performance of a judge, right? As we talked about in those previous studies, when you don't know what the actual score of the wines are, but you want to know how well is one judge performing throughout the competition. And again, the typical way that we do that is to simply say, well, let's see how well this judge performs relative to the average of the scores that's been assigned to a particular wine. Well, if we know that this ag 
average, which is an example of a linear aggregator, is a misleading representation, then to use the average to decipher how well the performance of a judge is, is going to be obviously a very misleading exercise. Okay, so this is one, uh, of course, a caveat of, of what we found uh, in terms of the results. So naturally, then the question becomes, how can we rectify this, right? How can we solve this particular problem then, given that we know linear aggregators can't do it? And the answer to that is, well, it pays actually then to perhaps examine alternative forms of aggregation. Because we know linear aggregators are not going to work, will there exist additional forms of aggregation that could potentially help us here? And the answer to that is potentially yes. And this was largely now based on these two studies, which I cited earlier, uh, Cabernet and uh, Parosian, and myself, uh, Professor Soon and Professor Sear from Brock as well. Uh, we look at this alternative way of mapping uh, scores by an individual evaluator by taking, examining how he evaluates wines across time or across a number of different samples. And then rather than just looking at the scores individually, what you want to do is you want to take the whole set of scores that has been given and construct from there a distribution for this individual taster. And when you construct a distribution across the scores that this individual judge has given out, you're able to map out what the average score is given is, what the way to how, how, the, how the distribution works in terms of what the standard deviations are and so on. You can map out exactly what that distribution is. And at the end of the day, the exercise that we might want to go through then is to map distributions across judges so that they actually mean the same thing, right? If, for example, so just as a quick demonstration then, if, for example, I'm a judge for a particular competition, let's say, and I'm, I'm very prone to give out, let's say, you know, very low scores. So I only give out, let's say, an average in 82 plus or minus five kind of thing. Whereas someone else is, is very prone to give out high scores, he gives out a scores of 90s, for example, with a with a very large deviation even, right? So he he's, his score spans from, let's say, 75 all the way to 100, but with a very high average of 90. Now, when you use these two individuals inside a panel, obviously discrepancies are going to arise. One is going to really uh, introduce these huge biases across this, this average score, if that's what we're going to be using. So instead, what we would like to do is to map the averages for this one individual into the average of the other one so that they actually mean the same thing and then remap the distribution. So if the one individual is very tight with the scores so that his distribution is very narrow around a particular score and the other one is very wide in terms of the scores that he gives, what we want to do is just re rewrite these numbers so that they mean the exact same thing when we actually interpret it. Okay? And so that's exactly where this, uh, this research has been leading us um, to explore. And uh, so hopefully I will have some results for you the next time uh, in the Covey Lecture Series. Thank you for your attention. All right. Well, thank you very much, Professor Kwong. It's really interesting, uh, su such an interesting topic. And um, I, I guess as I, as I listened, um, a question that, that, that I had for you was just as you look at, at this type of research, is it, it, is it as simple as saying that you could take this research and apply it to, to just about any judging platforms, if you will, or, you know, other competitions? I mean, it's... Yeah, yes, of course. Uh, so the application here is purely in terms of why, because I'm giving a talk for Covey. And in fact, we actually use this application in why uh, for one of our publications. But, you know, a lot of what we've, we've done here, including the, the paper that I cited earlier, was actually looking at stuff like... Um, research grant applications, right? How do we evaluate research grants? If you go for a short grant, for example, you, know, you have a panel of judges that you evaluate it and they assign some sort of numerical score to it. How do you aggregate up that information? So a lot of this is actually, you know, transferable to other um, exercises as well, not just limited to wine competition. Yeah, yeah, that, that's interesting. And I guess another question that I, that I would have is how, how did you come upon this area of of, of research? Uh, because it is so it's 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 so interesting, and especially when you apply it to things like wine competitions and that. Um, was there one genesis to your to, to your interest in this uh, this topic? Well, problems like this has actually already existed in economics for quite a while. So you know the idea of social choice and how individuals how do we summarize group preferences is a, is a big problem within economics. 
um, simply because we would like to always implement the most optimal thing, right? And the most optimal thing that's voted out of a group may not always be the best. And the question becomes, how do you aggregate up that information? And here, you know, when I when I when I myself go into the wine shop and I and I and I buy a wine, you know, like I said before, if you see a Robert Parker score, for example, it's just a score from a single individual, so it's much more useful, right? It's it's easier for me to see a 92 is bigger than a 90, or a, yeah, 92 is bigger than a 90, and so therefore it's in principle a superior wine. But when I see different wines that have you know, gold medals, so many of these different gold medals or, or silver medals or ratings that are not really clear, you know, decanter 98. Well, what does exactly as a decanter 98 mean? It's not very clear in that sense. So, so we kind of pursued it in that avenue as well. Uh, you know, just kind of merging or combining these ideas from economics with what we actually observe on an everyday basis uh, in our wine shops. Yeah, and, and then I guess the final question for you is just in terms of where you take it from here. You mentioned about looking at these alternative uh, judging, you know, uh, um, uh, systems or, or methods. Uh, is that sort of your primary focus now as uh, what you're working on currently and, and looking toward the future? That, that is something that we're currently looking at just to see how we can actually use these different types of distributions. Because when we start talking about the whole distribution, it's a very nonlinear aspect. And the problem that there's a lot of difficulties that arise, uh, technically speaking, from doing these type of uh, exercises. So yeah, so that's uh, that's one of the primary areas that we're looking at in terms of uh, what we're currently working on. We hope, to, we hope to have some results for you soon. I look forward to uh, hopefully uh, hearing your your lecture uh, next year. Um, and so with that, I will I will say thank you very much for presenting uh, today, Professor Kwong, and uh, um, and for for offering your insights into this uh, this area of research, which is really interesting. So um, as with all the other uh, Covey lecture series uh, presentations, um, this one will be available on the uh, Covey website. Um, shortly um, in, the, in the coming days and weeks. Um, you'll be able to find all of the lecture series uh, events from, from this year and from previous years on that website at uh, brocku.ca slash Covey. Um, and so with that, this wraps up the 2021 Covey Lecture Series. So on behalf of uh, Covey Director uh, Debbie Ingalls and uh, all the other staff at Covey, I uh, just want to say a, a big thank you to all of the presenters and, of course, everybody who took part in the in the lectures and uh, and you know watched them and and asked questions and uh, um, we really appreciate the the interest in in what's happening in Covey. So um, thank you so much, thank you, Professor Kwong, and uh, and to all the presenters and uh, we hope to see you next year. Thank you very much. Thank you.